My sincere thanks to Mwatan for its generous invitation to engage in dialogue during this time of monsters. I am speaking with you today from the belly of the beast, the opulent West, specifically Canada. And I come to you with infinite grief for what Palestinians have endured over this past year and century, with infinite disappointment in the Western Academy's abject failure to oppose genocide, and with infinite solidarity for Palestinian liberation and resistance. As a black scholar writing from within the comforts of the imperial core and upon stolen indigenous land, I am disgusted by the complicity of our institutions in failing to meet this harrowing moment. And I'm dedicating my scholarly work to naming what we refuse to name and to engaging with, rather than evading, the discomfort of our hypocrisy, cowardice, and our racism. I know I am only one voice, but I will use that voice as forcefully and as relentlessly as I can to fulfill our long abandoned promises of equality and liberty. These are promises which we have superficially held as the theory we hold dear, but which we have practiced with overwhelming contradiction and avarice. I have witnessed these contradictions firsthand. I was an assistant professor at Toronto Metropolitan University, an institution branded specifically as a safe haven for students and faculty advocating for racial justice, and which paradoxically had the most racist reprisal against Palestine solidarity in Canada. At TMU, the administration effectively threatened one sixth of the student body at the law school with expulsion, not even for setting up a Palestine encampment, but merely for writing a Palestine petition. Students who we teach about the importance of the written word threatened with expulsion for daring to use it. Further, I am a doctoral student at Columbia Law School, where a police officer discharged a firearm in a university building while quelling political dissent where pro-Palestinian protesters, many Jewish, have been defamed as anti-Semitic for their opposition to the industrial slaughter of Palestinians, where a university president will, before Congress, parrot defamatory attacks on pro-Palestinian academics, willing to name the obvious injustices endured by Palestinians. I have always known of the ranked hypocrisy in North America, but I perhaps foolishly did not believe that it would reach the craven and incalculable depths it has reached this past year. Let me be clear. I am, of course, appalled by the right-wing nationalism and imperialism that dominates our social, economic, and political institutions. But my greatest disgust is reserved for those who pose as advocating for racial justice and yet who remain silent in the midst of the most obvious racial injustice, the occupation, apartheid, and genocide of a people. A chorus of center-right to far-left voices should be, if they were principled, unanimous in their opposition to the genocide in Gaza, which, as you all know more than anyone, also includes daily atrocities throughout the region more broadly. Yet so many of us, including senior racial justice academics and activists, remain silent. These are who Malcolm X called the foxes, those who pose as a friend to the wretched of the earth and then ultimately devour them when opportunity strikes. In my lifetime, there has never been a clearer moment than the Gaza genocide of such subterfuge. I have been predictably disappointed by liberal intellectuals, an activist in this self-evident context of catastrophe. But I am most outraged by the ongoing silence and therefore the undeniable complicity of the so-called critical legal establishment. So many words for diffuse, subtle, and linguistic mechanisms of hierarchy. Mechanisms, to be clear, which matter. Indeed, these are mechanisms that construct the very dehumanization of Palestinians upon which this genocide is built. Yet still, so few words, often no words, about the systematic destruction of Gaza. 
as Isabella Hamad explains, the bombs that rained down on Gaza were not made of language, and they certainly were not metaphors. To say nothing in the midst of such material catastrophe, in the midst of countless daily atrocities committed for over a year against a captive population of multi-generational refugees who have been made to pay for the sin of European anti-Semitism is indefensible. That silence, especially from those positioned as scholars of racial justice, is deafening. And it is that silence that compels me to speak out about how we have failed and continue to fail the Palestinian people, and thus continue to fail ourselves based on the commitments we pretend to hold dear. I began my remarks by referring to the immense grief, disappointment, and solidarity I am feeling today, and it is those strong, visceral emotions that motivate this presentation and the written work associated with it. By drawing on my personal experience of reprisal for solidarity with Palestine over the past year, I intend to specifically articulate the many forms of racism that have strategically posed as anti-racist within North America and relatedly to examine the uses and abuses of identity in our rhetoric and advocacy for racial liberation. As a roadmap, I will outline four ideas today. First, an introduction to what I mean by racist anti-racism. Second, the context underlying my analysis, namely the colonization of Palestine and critical race theory critique of Zionism. Third, the case study of Palestine activism and Zionist reprisal, including how notions of identity and ideology are strategically deployed to either describe or obscure the social context of racial hierarchy in Palestine. And fourth, I conclude by noting the urgency of re-politicizing our identity politics towards the racial liberation of all people. First, let's discuss racist anti-racism. Racism is most fundamentally about power, not identity. And this central tenet of racism is displayed astonishingly in the current moment, which can be helpfully described as racist anti-racism. With a death toll in Gaza now likely exceeding 200,000, racist anti-racism turns the world upside down. It is those opposing genocide who are racist, and those supporting it who are anti-racist. Such a formulation is, of course, absurd, but it is a formulation made legible, in part, by a fetishization of identity in our conceptualization of race. Where race is a floating signifier, so too is fighting racism. Put differently, as race floats, racism and anti-racism float alongside it. The end consequence is that even the most obvious manifestations of racism, even genocide, can be re-articulated as anti-racist. What specifically do I mean by racist anti-racism? The phrase is, of course, contradictory. Anti-racism is, by definition, not racist. But the contradiction must be highlighted to accurately capture what is happening. The phrase racist anti-racism denotes specifically the recent expansion of anti-racist discourse, policies, and institutions in service of racism. For example, anti-racist discourse describes racial hierarchy. Racist anti-racist discourse obscures racial hierarchy. Anti-racist policies prevent discrimination. Racist anti-racist policies promote discrimination. Anti-racist institutions pursue racial liberation. Racist anti-racist institutions pursue racial domination. There's a particular mischief in racist anti-racism motivating my critique of it. Racism is always wrong. But racist anti-racism exploits this moral clarity. It occupies the mantle of racial justice while perpetuating racial injustice. In this way, it is a brilliant tactic, albeit amongst the racially ill-informed. 
it perpetuates racism while labeling its opponents racist, a charge of serious moral condemnation, and moreover, a charge which people genuinely fear. This fear is essential, even if one is skeptical of racist anti-racism. Is it really anti-Semitic to criticize Israel? Fear of being labeled racist is enough to intimidate even well-meaning allies for racial justice. And so racist anti-racism does precisely the opposite of what principled anti-racism seeks to accomplish. It reinforces rather than resists racial hierarchy. In a time where cross-racial solidarity is more urgent than ever, racist anti-racism works across the ideological spectrum to suppress that very solidarity. For racists, racist anti-racism provides a self-righteous alibi for their continued racism. For example, Israel's so-called decolonial genocide. For moderates, racist anti-racism provides a caution alibi for their continued silence. That is, the so-called nuance and complexity of Israel-Palestine. And for anti-racism, racist anti-racism qualifies our language and analysis through either conscious or subconscious forms of appeasement. For example, Many support Palestinian freedom, but oppose or are uncomfortable with Palestinian resistance. In other words, the mystification of racist anti-racism impacts all of us, from racist to anti-racist. An analysis of racial identity without accounting for racial ideology is too easily co-opted for racial domination. We have witnessed this in the starkest of terms over the past year. In the Middle East, Israel's literal genocide of Palestinians has been described as anti-racist, while Palestinians' legal and moral right to resistance has been caricatured as terrorist. And here in North America, supporters of Palestinian freedom, or even just academic freedom, have been defamed as racist, while supporters of Israel's daily atrocities have been cast as anti-racist. As Jewish and anti-Zionist scholar Alana Lenton notes, quote, Zionism is a sanctioned way to express violent white supremacism in a West that tries to hide its foundational racism, end quote. If racist means anti-racist, then race means nothing. And race must mean something during the apex of racial domination, genocide. To evacuate race of meaning during a genocide is to deny the genocide itself. Never again was most fundamentally an ideological plea, not for Jewish supremacy, but against racial annihilation. We need a political lens to understand this basic interpretive point, and it is a racist anti-racism, which is in meaningful ways obstructing our vision. Second, my article will provide some essential context, which I only need to briefly outline here. As noted, race is most fundamentally about power, Consequently, the history and context of power in Palestine is essential to our anti-racist analysis of it. The article will describe Israel's supposedly decolonial colonization of Palestine, what some Zionists have described unironically as the greatest land back movement in history. Then I will provide a comprehensive critical race critique of Zionism. This critique will, of course, distinguish identity, Jewishness, and ideology, Zionism, which are strategically collapsed in racist anti-racism for the very purpose of obscuring the context from which power relations emerge in Palestine. Third, I will examine the case study of Palestine activism and Zionist reprisal by considering the uses and abuses of identity and ideology in our analysis of racism. The purpose of this analysis is not to fetishize ideology as a straightforward device for progressive racial analysis. Indeed, Zionists use both identity, that is, the safety of Jews, and ideology, that is, the virtue of Zionism, to defend racial supremacy. Rather, I consider how both identity and ideology can be manipulated to entrench or obscure racial domination. 
Identity looms large in our socio-legal discourse of injustice. In law, social identities act as gatekeepers to standing for claims ranging from discrimination to genocide. And across public and private institutions, initiatives relating to equity, diversity, and inclusion in large part conceptualize inequity with reference to protected grounds of identity. Indeed, the reprisal I confronted this past year was almost entirely articulated with respect to identity-based discrimination, namely my putative anti-Semitism. Yet when the impugned conduct is on closer, or really any, examination, anti-racist rhetoric and activism, to sanction it as racist reflects a substitution of ideological advocacy, that is, anti-racism, with a caricature of identity-based hate, that is, anti-Semitism. The Toronto Metropolitan University students never expressed anything anti-Semitic. That is not to say that they never expressed anything that others could object to, including on the asserted grounds of insensitivity, but certainly not hatred towards Jews. And of course, there is zero discussion on North American campuses about the policing of expression insensitive to Palestinians, since that would require the censure not only of many Zionist students and organizations, but also the Zionist universities themselves. In any case, returning to the TMU students' petition, one could, for example, disagree with the timing of the petition, that is, two weeks after October 7th though by that point over 4,000 Palestinians had already been massacred by Israel. One could object to the petition's support for armed resistance, even though it is a legal and moral right. One could challenge the petition's tone. It labeled Israel a settler colony and apartheid state, provocative language perhaps within the imperial core, but not particularly controversial in political or legal theory. And, one could dislike the petition's failure to ritualistically condemn Hamas. But when Hamas under Zionist hegemony signifies every Palestinian male in Gaza, the United Nations, and even student protesters in North America, indeed, my students were called terrorists in the Canadian press, such categorical condemnation would not only contradict the petition's support for armed resistance, but further, could be translated, ironically, into a condemnation of the students themselves. These objections are open to debate in the context of a university animated by intellectual inquiry rather than corporate sponsorship. But it is crucial to understand that each of these objections is best understood in terms of ideology, not identity. In the midst of a genocide, which the students, now a year later, were absolutely correct in identifying, their timing, positions, tone, and tactics were rooted not in hatred or even indifference towards Jews, identity, but rather in a principled commitment to anti-colonial and anti-racist struggle, ideology. Let me speak plainly. In the coincidental context of a self-proclaimed Jewish state, critique and yes, even resistant against that state, can indeed trigger discomfort for many, though certainly not all, Jewish people. This coincidence, however, should not restrict the zeal of our racial justice advocacy. Just the opposite. It should increase the passion of our advocacy, as it should make clear the racism inherent in ethno-nationalism. To reason otherwise, that is, to reason that ethno-nationalist anxiety is a normative concern for racial justice advocates, is to separate our analysis of race from our analysis of power. Ethno-nationalism is, by definition, an exercise of exclusive racial power. Consequently, to label anxieties regarding challenges to that power racist, to fundamentally misunderstand how critical racial analysis interfaces with power, not simply identity. The illogic that defames Palestinian resistance as anti-Semitic is the same illogic that defames anti-Zionist Jews as anti-Semitic. That is, it is a fundamentally racist logic, not for Jews, but for Zionism and thus against Palestinians, their stolen land, and their stolen lives. Lastly, 
I intend to conclude the paper with a call for repoliticizing our identity politics to maintain its original mission from the Combahee River Collective Statement, that is, the liberation of all identities from all oppressive ideologies, most notably here, our collective liberation from Zionism and more broadly from ethno-nationalism. As my colleague Vincent Wong explains, quote, the end game of the ethno-state doctrine of racism goes well beyond Palestine. It is a fight for the very soul and future of anti-racism as a politics and ethics. The final goal is a set of political, legal, and ideological structures where one can no longer talk about, learn about, name, or fight against racism as subordination and dehumanization. End quote. Either anti-racism will be reframed as the critique of racial hierarchy that it is meant to be, or its legitimacy will be overtaken by its cynical weaponization against Palestinians. A cynical weaponization that many racial justice advocates have effectively sanctioned through their unconscionable silence during the Gaza genocide. But a weaponization that I and others will continue to fight because we understand both intellectually and emotionally the timeless wisdom of Toni Morrison's words that the function of freedom is to free someone else.